So today we're going to talk about Hextel. Hextel is a two-part epoxy adhesive that is fantastic for restoration work, bonding art glass together, doing crack repair, doing a clear coat on a piece of glass. Its uses are actually just phenomenal. They'll cover just about anything. Glass to glass, glass to metal, glass to wood, glass to stone. Any of those items will go together with Hextel. It really is kind of a one-shot epoxy for doing just about anything you want to with the glass. Today we're going to talk about how to mix the Hextel, the ratios to use for proper A to B to make sure your mixtures come out correctly, the different things you need to use with Hextel to make it turn out correctly for the pieces that you are working on. You'll see there's a number of different things around me on the table here. These are kind of the different items that you want to have together for when you start working with Hextel. You'll see I have my Hextel, a part A and a part B. I've got my pieces of glass that I'm going to bond, some nitrile gloves. You always want to wear gloves when you're working with any type of chemicals. I've got a bag of whiting here. This is what we're going to use to clean our glass. I've got A1100, which is actually a pre-treatment and an adhesion promoter, not really a cleaner. We'll cover going over that. I've got mixing cups, pipettes, glass rods, a scale, some tape, lint-free cloths. As always, anytime I'm working on my table, I like to have a piece of cardboard down to catch any kind of refuse or anything that's going to happen so I don't mess up my tabletop as I'm working. I've also got a piece of plastic here that I'm going to use to wrap my glass once we're finished bonding. So we're going to kind of go through this step by step and just show you the different ways that Hextel works and the different processes used to get it to work for you. The first thing, of course, is going to be mixing your Hextel. When it comes to mixing Hextel, it's very important to make sure that your ratios are correct between your A resin and your B the hardener. Now if you're doing really small amounts of the Hextel, like if you're doing jewelry work or really, really tiny things, you can get away with doing it by the dropper full. Three parts of A, one part of B. The larger the amount that you mix of the Hextel, the more you're really going to start wanting to use a digital scale to mix it. The further that you're off in your mixture, the more likelihood you're gonna have problems with your bond joint and your adhesive over time. So we really do suggest using a gram scale. They're not terribly expensive. This one is a little uh, digiway scale that we carry. It goes down to 0 0.01 of a gram. So that's extremely accurate for what you wanna try and do. And we've got a little mixing cup here. The cups that you want to use, you can either use plastic like this, but you do want to make sure it's an inert plastic. A great way to test if you do have a plastic cup you want to use is to pour some acetone into this cup and leave it for a few hours. If after a few hours it either melts part of the cup or discolors it, really turns it kind of a, a really white, opaque color, that means the plastic is not chemically inert and you really don't want to use it to mix your Hextel. So with our gram scale, if we turn that on, you should be able to see as it sets itself in our little digital display there. So we'll put our mixing cup onto the scale and you'll notice that our scale is going to go up. It's at 2.1 grams right now. So we'll hit the tear button. That will zero our scale out. Now the piece that I'm working on that I'm going to be bonding, it's probably about oh, six, seven inches by five or six inches. So we're probably going to use around 10 to 12 grams of epoxy. Uh, over time, as you use Hextel, you'll begin to realize how much Hextel will take for certain things, joints, crack repair, things like that. This one's probably going to be about 12 grams of mixed epoxy. Now you remember, this is a 3 to 1 ratio. So we're going to have three parts of A, one part of B. So I'm going to try and fill into our mixing cup about 9 grams of part A. Now part A is a little more viscous. It's almost the consistency of, say, Cairo corn syrup in a way. I'm going to start pouring into my mixing cup and try and get about 9 grams. I went a little bit over there. So about 9.5 grams, and that's fine. And it was about 9.5 grams. I'm going to zero out my scale again, and since it is a 3 to 1 ratio, you can take your 9.5 that I poured, divide it by 3, and it's about 3.15, 3.16. So that's about how many grams of Part B I'm going to add to this. And you can see from Part B, it's a little more liquid. You can see it sloshing around in there. 
it's a thinner viscosity than part A. Now, if you have really small amounts, you may want to actually do it by the dropper full. So if you used a pipette, you can put that into your part B and then apply that into your mixture. This way you can have much more accurate results in your measurements than just pouring part B in there. And I should have used about 3.16 and I've got about 3.23 in there. And that's gonna be fine. It's not gonna be perfect. You just have to be relatively close. So with mixing Hextel, I like to use a glass stirring rod. Uh, they're inert, they're easy to use, they're easy to clean. You can reuse them over and over. And you'll see, hopefully in the video a little bit here, as I try and mix it, that it's going to turn a little cloudy when you mix A and B together. You may be able to see the striations in there forming. So as you begin to mix your Hextel, you want to take it and make sure this cloudiness goes away. You want it to go clear again. So you want to keep mixing, make sure you get around the sides, into the bottom corners of your mixing cup, and just continue to mix until your mixture turns clear again. And you'll notice one thing, as I mix, I'm creating a lot of bubbles in that mixture. And this is the biggest problem a lot of people have with Hextel. What do I do about all the bubbles? Well, we're gonna show you a couple of things you can do. The easiest thing to do is just to let this sit. One of the advantages of Hextel is that it is extremely slow chemical reaction. So if you let it sit here for an hour or two, it will actually degas on its own. All these bubbles will rise to the surface and disappear. If you don't really have two hours to spend, you can also set up a vacuum pump system. And we're gonna show you how to do that shortly once this is mixed. And my Hextel's looking pretty clear now. So we're gonna actually set this aside and set up our vacuum pump system. So you'll see we have our Hextel here, still in our cup, and you can see it's still got quite a few bubbles in there. And this little system that we've set up here is just a very basic vacuum pump system. Uh, this is a small vacuum pump that we purchased off of Amazon. Very inexpensive. You don't need to draw a huge vacuum to degas Hextel. In fact, if you draw too much of a vacuum, it can actually create bubbles in here, and that's not what we want. With our little vacuum pump from Amazon, we also bought a little desiccating unit. This is the same thing that you use in kitchens for desiccating fruit or anything like that. Just a simple little desiccating jar that we have a valve on. Valves are very important. You definitely wanna make sure on whatever vacuum system you use, you have a valve to be able to control the vacuum. If you don't, you're just gonna create a tremendous amount of bubbles in this when you're trying to degas it. So all I'm gonna really do is put my Hextel inside my vacuum chamber, connect up my valve here. So I'm zoomed in on my Hextel inside our vacuum chamber a little bit so you can see what's going on. And I'm gonna turn on our vacuum pump. You may be able to hear that in the background a little bit. And I'm gonna open the valve. You should be able to see bubbles rising to the surface of our little cup of Hextel. And like I said, it's a weak vacuum pump that we have there. We don't want it too strong, so it is gonna slowly rise the bubbles to the surface. And you should be able to see in the video, it's starting to foam up quite nicely on the surface of our Hextel. It's pulling all those bubbles up from our mixture to the surface of the Hextel. Now you don't wanna really keep this going for too long. You wanna get the bubbles going, but you don't wanna create a giant foam head on your Hextel. So every once in a while, you're gonna to wanna to stop your vacuum chamber and bleed the air out a little bit. So now the majority of the bubbles are at the top of the Hextel. I'm gonna turn off the valve to my vacuum chamber and I'm gonna bleed it slightly. And you'll see most of these bubbles disappear. So I'm bleeding my chamber. And you can see most of that foam is going back into the Hextel. So I'll seal my chamber back up, start my vacuum again, and we'll pull the bubbles to the top again and let them burst some more. And this is kind of a routine that you'll do back and forth if you wanna try and use a vacuum chamber to degas your Hextel. It takes about 10, maybe 15 minutes, depending on how many bubbles that you integrated into the mixture when you were mixing your Hextel. But it's certainly faster than waiting two hours for it to degas on its own. 
So while our Hextel is degassing, it's a great time to actually clean our glass. So I'm going to be bonding these couple of pieces. I've got a piece of lead crystal here and a piece of didymium glass. These are the pieces I'm going to be bonding together today. So let's show you how to clean these really well and make sure that they're cleaned well enough so that the Hextel will bond nicely to them. So with my didymium glass here, uh, I'm gonna bond this side to my piece, but I'm gonna clean both sides for you just so you can show what's going on. Now the easiest way to see if your glass is clean enough to bond with Hextel is to just get it wet with some water. So if I put some water on the surface of this glass and let it sit, you'll see perhaps from the video that it's kind of beating up like the surface of a wax car. Uh, it's breaking apart. You can see different surfaces in the glass. It's not sheeting and staying on the glass very nicely. Uh, if you have pieces and you put water on them and they beat up like this, you're almost guaranteed that you're going to have a problem with your bond joint. You need to clean this glass. There's something on the glass that's going to interrupt your Hextel. Now a lot of people will use things like isopropyl alcohol or Windex or things like that. You really want to avoid using those things. Uh, Windex, household cleaners, things like that. They actually have surfactants on in them that will put a coating onto your glass and you'll have the same problem here with the water beating up, which is why this is an excellent way to test your glass to see if it is ready to be bonded with the Hextel or not. So my favorite for cleaning glass is calcium carbonate or whiting. Uh, it's a very simple material here. I've got a pound of it here. And all I'm going to do with this is I'm going to take a little bit of this in my hand, get it wet on the surface of my glass, and then scrub with my hand. It's a great detergent and a great way to get all the materials off the surface of the glass. So I'm going to clean this side real quick with the whiting. Get a little bit of water running, get my hand wet, and basically just make a slurry of this on the surface of the glass. Now I'm going to use my hand to just scrub the entire surface of the glass. All the edges, and before I started working, I actually put a seaming bevel around all these edges. You do not want to do something like this with a piece of freshly cut glass, or you'll end up with most of your fingertips in the sink as well. So this glass was beveled before I started doing this. Like I said, I'm just using whiting, and some good old fashioned elbow grease to scrub the surface of the glass. Once I'm done, you just wash the whiting off. And then I'll let some water stay on the surface of this glass and you should hopefully see, you know, even if I pour off most of the water from the surface of the glass, it's sheeting on the glass very nicely. I don't have any breaks in it. It's not beating up. And you can see I have very little water on the surface of the glass now. I'm shaking most of it off. And none of it is beating up on the surface of the glass, even in the corners. It's looking really nice. This is my nicely polished side that I'm gonna be bonding. And I need to clean it as well. So if I put some water on it and bring it back up, you can see the water is beating up all over this. In fact, there's very little water on the surface anymore because all of it came off. There's virtually no sheeting action on this glass at all. It all beaded up and fell off. This glass is very, very dirty. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to get a little bit of my calcium carbonate, my whiting. Get it wet. And scrub the surface of my glass. and pay special attention to the corners as well. A lot of people ignore that, and that's where you can have a lot of glue failures if you don't clean the corners of your glass really well. You get the main surface and the edges, but a lot of people forget to really scrub the corners. Wash all my calcium carbonate off. And now you can see the water is sheeting on the glass quite nicely. It's not beating up, it's not falling off. I've got a really nice sheet of water on that glass that's really not coming off. 
By the time we were done cleaning our glass, and you can see I've put those down on some lint-free paper towels. These things are great. You can buy them from Lowe's, Home Depot. They're just contractor paper towels that are lint-free. You really want to try and stick with lint-free stuff for bonding with Hextel so you don't get any fibers into your glue joints. But as you can see, since cleaning our glass, our vacuum pump has done a really nice job of degassing our Hextel. Uh, it's looking really good. There aren't any bubbles in it anymore, so I'm ready to go and ready to use this now. Now that everything is clean, I really don't want to be touching my glass. And since I'm going to be working with Hextel, which is a chemical, I do want to start using gloves now. Now you could use these when you're mixing Hextel as well. It's just you'll end up having to take them off to clean your glass unless you clean your glass before you mix your Hextel. But I do like wearing gloves when I'm working with the Hextel on the glass to both keep the Hextel off of my hands. If I'm using it a lot, you want to avoid constant contact with any kind of chemical agent and to also prevent me from putting any of my skin oils on the glass accidentally, which would cause a problem for bonding with the Hextel. So now that I have these ready, let's take a look at my setup. So I've got my cardboard down and I've got my piece of plastic down. Now I'm gonna take my bottom piece, which is my lead crystal piece, and Hextel has a seven day room temperature cure time, which means whatever you bond together, you need to keep that in orientation for a minimum of three days at room temperature. Uh, any, if you don't have a way of keeping things in orientation, my piece of glass here, my didymium, is gonna slide around and slide off, and then eventually the Hextel will cure enough so that it's going to get stuck in place and I won't be able to move it. I'll have to take everything apart and start all over again. So you need to come up with scenarios for keeping your pieces in orientation for the time frame that it needs to cure. Now, since I am gonna cold work this on the exterior different times and I'm not really concerned with the sides or the back of my piece, I'm just gonna take some strapping tape and make a little cross underneath my piece here that I can then fold my tape up on top of a didymium sheet to hold everything in place over time. If you're doing larger structures, you can do things like cut out cardboard buttresses and then hot glue them on to keep pieces in orientation. Whatever it takes and whatever means necessary to keep your pieces in the order that they need to be while the Hextel cures, that's what you need to try and accomplish. So I have my lead crystal piece ready. So the next piece I'm going to need is my didymium sheet. Now, the thing we haven't talked about yet is gonna be our A1100. That's this material, the amino silane. Now, a lot of people want to treat the A1100 like it's a cleaning agent. So they will clean their glass with A1100 and say, oh, I'm done. Well, that's not really the case. As you saw from our water usage test, you really need to clean your glass extremely well. And A1100 is not really a detergent. It's not really a cleaner. It's actually a pretreatment for adhesion promotion. So it will help the Hextel bond to the silica in your glass. Now, the A1100 is not gonna be as necessary if you're doing very small pieces. Uh, jewelry work, small things that are connected, small surface areas, but the larger your surface area gets, the more this becomes what we like to refer to as cheap insurance. You can put this onto your glass and make sure that your Hextel is gonna bond edge to edge very nicely. Now, there are a couple of ways to apply this. You can put it into a spray bottle and spray your surface area or you can put it onto a lint-free cloth and wipe your surface area, whatever you want to do. The mixture is actually a, about a 10% A1100 silane in a mixture of reagent grade isopropyl alcohol. So the alcohol will evaporate off the surface of your glass and leave a thin layer of the A1100 on the surface of your glass, prepping it chemically for the Hextel. So let's show how to do that real quick. I'm just gonna use my lint-free paper towels because wiping that on the surface of my pieces will not leave any small threads. So you, once again, very, very important to try and get a lint-free material. So I'll open up my A1100, and I'm just gonna put some onto my paper towel. I'm gonna wipe the surface of my glass, and on the video, you're probably not going to be able to see this but it will leave a film on the glass that looks almost like an oil slick. So you get those same Newton's rings, little rainbow effect that you would see in an oil slick on water in a parking lot. That's the same appearance that you're gonna have on the surface of your glass when you use the A1100. So I'm gonna do the same thing to the surface of my didymium glass. 
I'm gonna put a little bit of the isopropyl alcohol onto my lint-free paper towel. And I'm going to wipe down the side of my dynamium glass that I'm going to bond with my lead crystal. Again, I'm going to check it in the light to make sure everything evaporates off of it and it's nice and dry before I proceed with anything else. When you're bonding two pieces of glass together, you don't want to take your piece of glass and put it directly straight down onto your other piece of glass. What you'll end up doing with your Hextel is trapping thousands of bubbles all along here which will show up in your bond joint. It won't be a clean bond joint. What you want to try and do, whether it's a square piece of glass or a round piece of glass, whatever it's like, you want to actually start at an angle and slowly lower your glass piece down onto your lead crystal. This will allow the Hextel to contact on one area, slowly move up your glass and allow air channels to move air out so you don't trap bubbles. So the other part of that is making sure that when you apply your Hextel to your glass, you make sure you have a design that will accommodate for air channels moving in this direction. So if you were doing a round piece of glass, I generally put a puddle of Hextel in the middle and one stream coming out from it. So I can lower my second piece down, it'll pick up the stream, hit the puddle and go out to the circle. Now this is a square piece of glass. So the way I like to proceed with this is actually to make an X on my surface. If you were to do a very long rectangular piece of glass, you may want to do a tree structure where you have one long line going up and then branches of Hextel coming out at angles. So it fills out through the piece as you lower your piece down. Now you can either pour out directly from your mixing cup if you like, or you can use a bulb pipette. If you have smaller surface areas and you want to control the amount of Hextel that you're using, I suggest using the bulb pipette to pour out your Hextel. For this one, I've got a fairly large area, so I'm just going to bend my cup a little bit and pour directly out of my cup. So I'm making one part of my X here. Then I'll start my other part here. Make sure to fill these in some. I may have used a little bit too much Hextel, so I'm going to save a little bit of that. You can always scrape off the edge there. So you can see my Hextel here is looking pretty good. Now, if you aren't very good at pouring yet and you end up trapping bubbles into your Hextel, you might find it necessary to have a metal pick or a glass pick, something with a nice sharp edge on it that you can then dip into your Hextel and pull any bubbles that you may have trapped in your pour out. So now I'm going to show you how to lower your piece down. So you can see I'm avoiding, even with gloves, touching the other sides of my piece of glass, gauging exactly where my glass is going to go. And I will start at one end and slowly lower my piece down. You want to be careful when it makes that first contact not to rush or you will trap more bubbles on the glass. And hopefully in the video you can see the Hextel slowly walking up my piece of glass as I go. And you just want to slowly and steadily lower your piece of glass down and let the Hextel walk up the glass. Like I said you don't want to go too fast because you don't want to make contact with the entire area of Hextel at one time or you're liable to trap a lot of bubbles into your Hextel, which either means a lot of work to get them out of the joint before it cures, or just taking this piece of glass off and starting over from scratch and cleaning off all the Hextel that you've put on here. And I have done it, and it is no fun. It's a lot of acetone and a lot of paper towels. And now that the Hextel is supporting the glass enough, I can actually let go and it will move the rest of the way up. And you can see on all the 
corners or on the long edges, the air is, has an escape route. So what you wanna do now is just apply a little bit of downward pressure in the middle of your piece and make a small circular motion. This will push out the rest of the hex tool to the edges and the corners of your piece. And you can begin to see why having just the right amount of hex tool can be very advantageous. You get very little runoff. I've got a little bit of runoff coming out of this corner. I'm probably gonna have some over here. But if you maintain just enough hex tool in here, you'll have a very minimal amount of runoff to deal with. And it's far less messy. If you don't have enough hex tool, you run the risk of not being able to reach all your sides or all your corners, or as you put this down, air pressure can actually push in on your corners and actually remove Hextel from your corners. So when you come back in a few days, you'll see little corners in your piece that don't have any Hextel because you didn't have enough in there and the air pressure was enough to lift this up slightly and want to make a bubble or a circle out of the liquid underneath of the Hextel. So having just enough Hextel on there to make sure it reaches your corners is a very good idea. Also being able to use my tape here to make sure that I'm tightly taping down my top didymium piece so that it does not float up at all, but maintains good positive downward pressure with my lead crystal glass underneath. And I'm a little bit off, so I'm gonna have to take this up again and readjust. Making sure that you have good coverage on your piece. All my corners there. And now my piece is nice, taped up, in place. I'll leave this for about three days. That'll be enough for this hex tool to gel nicely and then I can take my tape off and move the piece around. I still can't work it because it is not completely cured, but three days is enough for this to be solid enough that I can take the tape off and move the piece. Seven days will be an absolute full cure, and that's when I can start cold working this piece and manipulating it further, rebonding and gluing it again.